All right, I think we're ready to go. So next up we have Paul Royal, and he's going to talk to us about how he has measured malicious activity related to Alexa top-ranked domains. Thank you. So uh, as mentioned, I'm Paul Royal. I'm a research consultant for Barracuda Labs, um, which is the research and threat analysis division of Barracuda Networks. And when I'm not consulting for Barracuda, I am research faculty at the Georgia Institute of Technology and associate director of the Georgia Tech Information Security Center. But today I'm wearing my Barracuda hat. So um, I'll start by providing some very brief background, uh, including uh, the establishment of, for the purposes of this talk, a common definition of what a drive-by download is. And uh, then I will reference several uh, drive-by downloads that were facilitated via popular website compromises, or at least those that uh, Barracuda Labs reported on within the last year. And with that as a motivating segue, um, I'll talk about what we hope to achieve by attempting to quantify the impact of maliciousness uh, originating from top-ranked domains. And then uh, after I have pared away what I think uh, can be measured, um, I'll go into details of, of how we performed the experiment, or how we architected it. Um, and then I will discuss or present an analysis of the results. Uh, and then I will conclude the talk with, uh, with a few, um, with a small summary. Okay, so uh, again, for the purposes of this talk, and I'll be as quick as I, as I can because I'm sure everybody in here already knows what a drive-by download is, but it's an attack where malicious content is served to the web browser or its plugins. Uh, it's intended to occur without the user's knowledge, so it's supposed to be surreptitious in nature, and uh, if it's successful, you have arbitrary attacker-decided code being executed on the target system. Uh, in order to facilitate a drive-by download, uh, attackers, for example, can use emails, links, for example, referencing a purchase that the target did not make, um, or they'll employ traditional search engine optimization techniques so that uh, search results uh, lead to malicious content. Or finally, they can compromise a popular, legitimate website. And that's, this last bullet is what this talk is going to focus on. Uh, as an example, um, Barracuda Labs runs a, a, a URL analysis system that I'll describe in this talk, but in June of last year, uh, we found that Rolling Stone, which is a popular U.S., uh, or it's at least a, a popular English website, um, served visitors drive-by downloads. And in this case, the malicious content originated from uh, rollingstone.com's use of an ad network. In this case, it was uh, Google's DoubleClick. Um, and uh, ultimately, the browser and its plugins were served malicious content uh, from a site backed by the Sweet Orange Exploit Kit, which, uh, as some of you may know, has become quite popular. Uh, in this case, zero access was installed um, if, the, uh, if the system was successfully compromised. And obviously, there's a little bit of irony um, with regards to uh, malware being delivered via an ad network that makes money for its operators primarily through click fraud. Continuing on, uh, in October of last year, a much more significant event occurred uh, in that php.net uh, was serving visitors drive-by downloads. And in this case, redirections to malicious content uh, were, the were the result of a direct website compromise. Uh, these ultimately, the redirections ultimately led to a site backed by uh, the Magnitude Exploit Kit. And I think this is much worse um, than, say, Rolling Stone or Hasbro.com. Uh, because uh, visitors of PHP.net are likely uh, to be individuals in positions of technical authority and privilege. Um, so that's kind of a bummer. When this was first identified, um, this was actually first identified by Google, uh, I think publicly, because they proceeded to add PHP.net, um, I believe, to their blacklist. And uh, the PHP.net maintainers responded by, uh, by saying that it was a false positive. Uh, and then in response to that, Barracuda Labs released a PCAP uh, of an actual drive-by download session involving PHP.net, uh, at which point, after some analysis, the PHP.net uh, operators took down a server and uh, revoked some SSL certificates. So uh, in this case, uh, providing evidence um, to inform the community, I think, actually resulted in a quicker response. But uh, more on that later. So. Um, Obviously, drive-by downloads are a big problem because they're a popular way to get malware onto target systems, uh, whether you want to build a commodity botnet or uh, specifically infiltrate uh, 
uh, an organization or, or an individual of interest. Um, we'd like to better understand the extent of the problem, what the incidence of drive-by downloads are. And uh, in this case, that measurement necessarily involves detection, the detection of, of drive-by downloads. Um, and in this case, we would like detection to be as generic as possible. Um, so we don't want to, if possible, we don't want to rely on prior knowledge of specific exploits or vulnerabilities. Um, and uh, at least for me, given that I come from an academic background, uh, I would like any results that we publish um, to be uh, transparent in terms, of, in terms of their methodologies and more importantly, reproducible by third parties who can verify our results. Of course, uh, the scale of the problem space, checking the entire web for drive-by downloads, uh, makes comprehensive measurement of the problem difficult. Uh, I guess unless you're an entity like Google um, or maybe Microsoft. Um, so uh, for our case, uh, we decided to focus on looking at maliciousness in top rank sites. Uh, we felt that the, this subspace of the problem was tractable in size, that basically three guys in a research lab could, uh, could try and tackle it. Uh, and significant in its impact because, again, you're dealing with the most popular, presumably the most popular websites. Um, and in addition, instead of sourcing uh, the popularity or instead of determining the popularity of a website uh, from, say, Barracuda Network's appliances, uh, we wanted something that would generalize popularity beyond, uh, for example, the centricity associated with the deployments of appliances in a specific country. Um, so we ended up actually using a different um, as implied by the title of this talk, a different source uh, of popular websites. So again, we want to identify drive-by downloads um, so we can again measure their impact as they pertain to their, their, their incidence or appearance in top-ranked websites um, without relying on, on any specifics of what vulnerabilities are exploits, what vulnerabilities are targeted or what specific exploit kits, for example, are used. Um, and we ended up settling on a, a black box approach. Um, so with that black box approach, we decided to basically prioritize knowledge that something had happened over how it had happened, because we can actually go back and determine how it, uh, it had, had happened. Uh, and indeed, we felt, uh, and hopefully you'll be convinced at the end of this um, presentation, that uh, we were able to reduce our dependence on prior knowledge, that we uh, again, didn't need to, uh, to look for uh, any specific indicators um, other than the results of a drive-by download. Uh, and I'll get to that in a little bit. And then in order to make sure that um, our black box approach was accurate or to assess its efficacy, uh, we can combine it with white box analysis to achieve whatever granularity of knowledge we want. We can determine the how once we know that, that something has happened. So uh, for our black box approach, we actually made uh, use of heavyweight virtualization, so um, like a, full, a fully instantiated heavyweight virtual machine. Uh, we started by creating a VM that had ubiquitously targeted software components, components that would likely um, be used or, or be targeted or attacked in a drive by download. Um, and uh, after we had the VM, we basically established a, a drive by download identification process whereby we would force a browser in the VM to visit uh, the website or basically the URL of our choice. Uh, we'll record the network traffic of that forced visit, uh, and we'll obviously let the VM execute for a short period um, after the visit. And then uh, from that traffic, heuristically identify whether a drive-by download occurred. Um, and this basically gave us a process and a, obviously a specific VM but then we built around that uh, an automation harness that would operate many of these VMs simultaneously um, on a given box. Um, uh, again, using various systems engineering techniques. Um, and then uh, once we actually had a harness, we could perform experiments. And once we had um, drive-by downloads that were heuristically identified, that were automatically identified, uh, we performed a manual white box analysis of the corresponding network traffic to make sure we didn't have false positives. Um, and, to, and again, to identify the how of, uh, of a particular event. So uh, with, with that covered, um, now that we know what we're going to try and um, create uh, experimental infrastructure to measure, let's talk about the specifics of how we architected um, our experiments. So um, 
Obviously, as the input source, we ended up deciding on taking the top 25,000 uh, of the uh, Alexa top uh, 1 million. So Alexa basically provides an in-order ranking of these domains. Um, and we took the, the top 25,000. Now, these are just the domains, which means if you force a virtual machine to visit them, you're only going to get the index page. But uh, this is, of course, a likely target for attackers um, because it will provide them greatest coverage relative to the prospective victims that, uh, that they'll get from the, uh, the corresponding campaign. In terms of the actual hardware, um, you can see here that we had just a, a 2U database node. This is commodity hardware with mechanical disks that uh, you can purchase from any major vendor. Uh, we ran open source uh, software, in this case Debian, Linux, and PostgreSQL is our database. And the database server just operates the database and houses the, uh, the outputs um, of the experiments. Uh, and then uh, together with the database node, we had just a standard 1U, 2 socket processing node. Again, no magic here. Um, but we were actually able to achieve significant scalability um, by using techniques like hardware virtualization extensions, which allowed us to overcommit um, virtual machines to physical cores. We were actually able to operate about 128 virtual machines at once on uh, this one U processing node. Uh, and again, we, we built it all off of uh, open source software, in this case, Debian Linux and uh, the kernel virtual machine uh, virtualization container, which has been mainlined in the Linux kernel for some time. So in terms of exactly what that vulnerable VM looked like, um, we started with uh, Windows XP SP2 and added no additional patches. Again, the plan is to create a virtual machine that is as vulnerable as possible to cast as wide a net as possible relative to potential exploits that will target it during these forced uh, browser visits. Um, and we used the, at the time, uh, the, well, we used the default version of the web browser that came with Windows XP, which is Internet Explorer 6. Um, in terms of the overall system, we actually migrated to IE8 last year. Um, and in terms of plugins, we had an older version of, of Acrobat Reader, Flash Player, and uh, the Java Web plugin. And uh, I mean, it's, you typically don't want to choose something that's as old as possible because then certain newer exploits won't actually work with it. Um, and exploit kit operators, as we know, will actually abandon the use of, of exploits that. Uh, are not actually netting them um, individuals because they're more, they're more troubled than they're worth because they can be detected. Um, in addition, um, uh, we'll probably be adding the Silverlight plugin soon because we've, we've started seeing exploit kits make use of, um, of vulnerabilities in the Silverlight plugin. But uh, this, is, this is the configuration as it was for the case studies that I'm going to report on. Uh, obviously, at some point with Windows XP now end of life, uh, we'll also want to try moving to Windows 7, although that results in a factor 8 increase in the amount of memory you have to give each virtual machine. So there is a, an implementation detail to work with. Um, all right, so on the processing node, we basically start a, a process. The process spawns a bunch of threads, and each thread will continuously uh, do the following, which is uh, obtain an unprocessed URL using a row-level locking mechanism to maintain concurrency and all that other stuff, all that good stuff. Um, and once it has an unprocessed URL, it will start basically a, a sterile version of the virtual machine um, that will be used to assess whether the, the URL, when visited, results in a drive-by download. Um, and right before we invoke the VM, we will start recording all the network traffic that will take place um, uh, during and after the forced visit. Uh, and then there's a, basically a script inside the VM that will, will, will facilitate uh, the browser going to the URL of our choice. Um, after the forced visit has occurred, we'll let the VM uh, execute for a little while, which is, again, hopefully enough time uh, for software to be compromised if it's going to be compromised. Um, and uh, I would add that in contrast to the general malware analysis, dynamic malware analysis plane where malware has many, many different ways to uh, exhibit uh, stalling behavior, it's a little bit trickier on the drive-by download side because if... Uh, if an exploit kit operator, again, is going to try and evade sandbox systems by having, um, having their malicious code activate after a certain period of time, that could actually prevent them from successfully targeting a legitimate user because the user will navigate to another portion of the site or to another site itself. So uh, in this case, it looks like the defenders may actually have uh, at least less of a disadvantage. Um, so in all cases, after... Um, after the virtual machine is allowed to execute for a brief period of time, we terminate it uh, and then use you know, automated means to, uh, to look at its network traffic and then a heuristic to determine whether a drive-by download occurred. So the question is, what is that heuristic? It's actually extremely simple. 
Um, for a given network session, we simply wanted to see whether an executable was forced to the VM. Um, so, you, for example, you can look for a given Ethernet frame, assuming no gzip compression or other things are being used, um, whether you can find uh, an MZ header and a PE header. Um, and normally, this heuristic for arbitrary HTTP traffic would result in a large number of false positives. And in this case, the, the utility of this as a heuristic is, is completely dependent on the context in which it is being used. Uh, again, in this case, we have top-ranked sites, and we have only the index page of top-ranked sites. And uh, I, at least, cannot name any top-ranked site that, when you visit its index page, will serve you a Windows executable. So in this case, the heuristic was, was actually somewhat useful. Uh, and, and actually, in practice, for our case studies, it, it worked remarkably well. Uh, we had two month-long case studies, and in the February, in the first of those case studies, we actually only had two false positives using this heuristic. And then for the second case study, we had no false positives. So in context, even a simple heuristic that normally wouldn't be very useful um, can actually fit the bill. So once we've identified that a, uh, a site, when visited, results in a drive-by download, we need to try and estimate the number of affected users. And uh, we don't have visibility to the traffic to those sites, so we're going to have to use some other means. Uh, now, Alexa uh, published the popularity of a site as a relativized percentage of all views that site receives. Um, and it doesn't publish the hard number for whatever combination of reasons. But you can actually use the statistics reported by other sites to determine this number. Uh, so for example, in February of 2012, Wikipedia self-reported about 15.75 uh, billion views, and Alexa reported a corresponding relative percentage of that. So once you have that hard number, because this a separate entity self-reported, you simply work your way backwards to actually determine what that number is, and then you uniformly apply it to all the other sites for which you have a relative percentage. Um, of course, that only gives you the number of affected views, and there can be significant variability uh, across sites. Like some sites may have a small number of views, and other sites have a large number of views. Fortunately, Alexa also publishes an estimation of how many views there are per user, so you can use this estimation to get the number of, of affected users. Of course, not all users served malicious content are likely to be compromised. So you have to then conservatively estimate the subset uh, that you think uh, actually had malware successfully installed in their systems. Um, and for that, we again turn to uh, both visitor statistics as well as vendor studies conducted by, um, for example, security companies. Um, and as one example, uh, over 50% of users um, for at least for the purposes of our study, were immediately disqualified because they used a platform that was seldom targeted or relatively exploit resistant. Um, and then even if they have the right combination, if, if they, even if they have a, a platform that is likely to be targeted, um, they still have to have a vulnerable software component that has a matching in the wild attack um, and is vulnerable to that in the wild attack. Uh, so if we use Java and I think um, uh, well, you'll see later why, why Java uh, was used. Um, it's enormously popular, obviously, as a target by attackers. Um, but uh, according to Adobe, who wants to try and show that Flash is really, really popular, and presumably that Java is not, uh, the Java web plugin is installed on 73% of users' systems. So that's probably a low order estimate. Um, and then according to Qualys, 42% um, of people who have the Java web plugin installed have a version that is vulnerable to an in-the-wild attack. Um, so you'll, you basically use these sorts of filters, and we ended up coming up with an estimation that about 15.5% of people served malicious content were likely to have been successfully compromised. And it's really hard to actually to, to, to verify the um, to verify the, the integrity of the um, of the subparts of this of this man of this measurement. But what you can do is is compare it to uh, the overall result you get. Uh, in this case, uh, there have been times. Uh, when the security community will get visibility into a drive-by download campaign that's backed by an exploit kit. They'll specifically get a look at the exploit kit control panel, and one of the statistics that it reports is, in fact, the load percentage, i.e., what percentage of users that were served malicious content by this exploit kit were compromised. And we see, um, and we, we see uh, variability, um, a little bit of variability in that, but a range of around 12 to 17%. 
and our estimation actually fits within this range. So um, again, it's hard to uh, it's hard to, uh, to to try and cross validate the other other bits uh, that we used in this estimation, but the percentage that we got. Um, does fit with inside the range of what we're actually seeing uh, attackers be, uh, uh, sorry, attackers uh, succeed with. All right, so with the, <coughs> with the uh, architecture of the experiment described, let's uh, talk about the results. So in February, again, we simply took the Alexa top 25,000 domains each day and fed them into the system, and we found that when visited, 58 of the Alexa top 25,000 uh, resulted in a drive-by download, and that uh, these 58 were not specific to one day or a handful of days, and that in fact, 73% uh, of the days in February uh, corresponded to at least one top-ranked site serving malicious content. Uh, and if we employ the previously described estimations, we have Again, even though it's just 58 sites, so you might say 58 out of 25,000, there's, there's, there's no problem. Well, these are the most popular sites in the world, and as a consequence, their impact is going to be significant. From these 58 sites, we estimate that about 10.5 million people were served malicious content, and again, a small subset of that, uh, about 1.6 million were likely successfully compromised. Here's a calendar that provides a, um, uh, a day-wise breakdown of drive-by downloads per day in February. And you see that some days are, in fact, higher than others. Um, I'm sure there, there, there are potential social reasons or, or other technical reasons. We definitely witnessed some, some common malicious infrastructure being used across several sites, a common malicious traffic distribution system or a common exploit kit. Um, and, but, but definitely more work in this area is, is needed. Uh, in terms of the age, um, we found that over 98% of the sites were at least a year old. And uh, there are a couple of different viewpoints on, on how that ties into the fact that they were used to distribute or to serve drive-by downloads. Um, but I like the, um, I like the idea that um, even, even popular sites that presumably have good resources and hopefully a mature security operations process can still have issues with, with security. Um, that this isn't something that, uh, that, that can be uniformly and completely uh, eliminated. In terms of uh, screenshots, and one thing I haven't mentioned until now is that we actually, we actually take a, a screenshot of the VM at regular intervals during the force visit so that we can see what the victim would have seen when their system was compromised. Uh, and I've basically chosen one example from, from each of the two months that I'll describe. The one for February is a drive-by download served by phpclasses.org. And in the, um, uh, the lower left-hand corner, you see what you would expect to see, which is the phpclasses.org website. Um, by the second, uh, screenshot. Interestingly enough, the browser is gone and an executable has been placed on the user's desktop. And um, we can certainly talk about this uh, maybe uh, after, afterwards, but the icon of that executable is actually a picture of Doncho Donchev. Um, so perhaps it is an attempt to infamize him. For May, uh, when visited, uh, 39 of the Alexa Top 25,000 resulted in a drive-by download. Uh, and in terms of the number of days where at least one domain served malicious content and the, uh, the number of, of affected and successfully compromised users, they all look pretty similar to, to February. Um, but in addition, for, for May, we added functionality to try and determine for how long uh, a site would be, uh, for how long a given compromised site would serve malicious content. And what we found, uh, perhaps, perhaps intuitively, is that most sites are compromised for a single day, probably because a portion of their users will, will complain to that site and its operators. Uh, but others, for example, heraldm.com, which corresponds to the Korea Herald, it's an extremely popular uh, news website in, uh, in South Korea, uh, was compromised, I think, eight out of a 14-day period. Um, so that's, that's unfortunate. In all cases, um, the average period of compromise was just over 36 hours as measured. In terms of screenshots for May, um, the, this, this example was, was sort of selected for its, its lack of, of visual interestingness, because this is typically what a drive-by download looks like. You have, uh, in this case, the site being fichajes.com, that's a uh, football as in soccer rumor website. Um, and in the first screenshot, you see fichajes.com. And in the second screenshot, you see fichajes.com. 
Um, and that's it. That's all you're going to see. The only indication you have that something might be wrong is the fact that the, the Java icon has popped up in the tray. Um, and in this case, the malware actually served um, rendezvous with its command and control uh, exclusively via DNS uh, and actually uses um, TXT records with base64 encoded arguments. Uh, so I mean, that's, this, this is the type of, of stealth I would assume most exploit kit or at most drive by download campaign operators are going to, to strive for. So for May, we performed additional analysis of the drive by downloads uh, to try and validate some, uh, some intuitions that we had. And one of them was that in the majority of cases, the badness for these top ranked sites is going to come through their ad networks because the sites themselves should be relatively resistant to, to intrusion. Um, but what we found was actually uh, the opposite. Uh, we found that only 46.1% of drive-by downloads for May um, arrived via the use of ad networks, which means that more than the remaining half um, um, were the result of some type of direct website compromise. Uh, and that's, again, un unfortunate. Um, the second intuition that we had was that Java is going to be involved in an overwhelming majority of drive-by download attacks. And again, an exploit kit is going to interrogate the web browser and its plugins and serve a cocktail of exploits that it believes are most likely to result in successful system compromise. But what we found was that uh, in 87% of the cases, at least one of those exploits was, in fact, for the Java web plugin. Um, and again, it, uh, it, it speaks to the attacker's um, preference of, of Java, or perhaps to the Java web plugin security track record. So in conclusion, uh, most people assume that, uh, probably not those in this room, but most people assume that it is safe to visit popular long-lived uh, long websites. Um, and to systematically evaluate this intuition, we, um, we, uh, we performed several month-long studies. And the results of those studies, again, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, to some indicate that even the mainstream popular web is not a safe place. So subsequent to this research, um, we created sort of a permanent version of the URL analysis system. And at some point, uh, we got the OK to uh, create a public web front end for it. And uh, we call it Threat Class. Um, and uh, in contrast to some other sites that may have technical or technically dense information, we tried to make this site accessible to both uh, casual users, casual end users, as well as, as, as professional members of the information, um, information security research community. Uh, Threat Glass provides virtual machine screenshots, VM screenshots, as well as different types of um, of visualizations of the network activity that occurred via the drive by downloaded. In fact, you can actually visually explore the, the data related to the event. Uh, of course, if you're like me, you're probably just going to click on the link that provides you with a full packet capture. Um, in all cases, um, to try and encourage people to, uh, to, to participate um, in, um, in this effort of identifying threats, um, We've uh, created a comment system where, for example, people can annotate the type of exploit kit that was used, or the type of malware that was dropped, uh, as well as uh, support for submitting websites to be inspected by the corresponding analysis system. And uh, if a site you submit is found to be malicious, it will, in turn, appear on the Threat Glass website. Um, so uh, you can get, um, again, you can get the, all the source data as well as more structured, high-level representations of the drive-by downloads for the two-month-long studies, as well as everything else we found since we started running the system at threatglass.com, um, which, again, is, is free to use. <laughs>